Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently have had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And in our ongoing series of Nobel Prize winners, tonight we're going to talk about Roger Chen, who died recently at the age of 64, brilliant man, and he was one of the three Nobel Prize winners in chemistry in 2008. Now, many of the Nobel Prizes in chemistry today are intimately related to biology and medicine, and that was the case with Dr. Chen and his two co-winners. And actually, their Nobel Prize was about 30 years in the making. The first of the three winners was Osamu Shimomura, who in the early 60s discovered that jellyfish from the Puget Sound glowed a blue-green, and he isolated the protein that was responsible for that, and it was called GFP, or green fluorescent protein. Jellyfish color was actually sort of a blue, but when it was exposed to UV light, it became a brighter green. For 30 years, this knowledge remained untapped, until in the early 1990s, Martin Chalfi, the second winner, figured out how to insert the GFP into other living organisms. When GFP was inserted into living organisms, we could then see and study their organs, tissues, and cells, and even at some point, the microcellular structures. Roger Chen, the third winner, who we'll talk about tonight, purified GFP, improved upon it, figured out how to insert it actually into the genetic structure of organisms, and then was able to figure out variants of GFP that were different colors, so we could essentially draw a map of an organism or of the cellular structure or even the genetic structure of an organism and find out when and how its genes were expressing themselves. Here is the explanation and the award of the 2008 Nobel Prize in Chemistry to the three men who were responsible for GFP, green fluorescent protein. Osamu Shimomura, who grew up in Japan during the Second World War, discovered the green fluorescent protein in a humble jellyfish from the Pacific Ocean in the early 60s. 30 years later, 1993, Martin Chalf found against all odds that jellyfish GFP could be put into any organism from bacteria to animals and still fluoresce when illuminated by ultraviolet light. And soon thereafter, Roger Sien engineered a whole palette of fluorescent proteins that shine in all colors of the rainbow. These discoveries and, and developments set off the GFP revolution. And today, these tiny molecular flashlights are used in laboratories across the world to illuminate scientific questions ranging from biophysical chemistry through molecular and cellular biology all the way to ecology and evolution. On behalf of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, I wish to convey to you our warmest congratulations, and I now ask you to step forward to receive the Nobel Prize in Chemistry from the hands of His Majesty the King. Andrew Chen was a nice Chinese boy born in New York, moved to New Jersey, and he was a child prodigy. He was a Westinghouse science winner, graduated summa cum laude from Harvard, went to Cambridge, came back to the United States to Berkeley, and settled ultimately in the University of California, San Diego, which is where he did his work. I can't emphasize enough not only how brilliant he was, but what a very nice guy he was, and a really humble guy, and unlike some Nobel Prize winners, he was never loath to give credit to others. Here's a little bit of the speech he gave right after he won the Nobel Prize when he returned to UCSD. And he mentions a man named Douglas Prasher, and I'm going to talk a little bit about him after this clip. Well, thank you all for coming and uh, being so warm in your congratulations. There's not much I can say but just to thank the mobs and mobs of people who've been uh, involved in lots of ways. Uh, and, of course, I'm really delighted to share with my colleagues, Osama Shimamura and Martin Chalfi, who I've known for quite a while and whose work is what made all of this possible. Of course, I need to thank the people in my lab who actually did the experiments uh, when I still really can't do this type of stuff myself in my own hands. And all of that was made possible by the DNA that we received as a gift from Douglas, a generous gift from Douglas Prasher, who was the man who cloned GFP and uh, who made both uh, Marty, Marty Chalfie's and our work uh, possible. So, uh, of course, this was done at UCSD in the 
warm scientific environment we've got here, uh, which is a, you know, a great community, not just at UCSD, but the other institutions on the Mesa, which is a collaborative place that we can uh, you know, freely exchange all sorts of interesting uh, uh, scientific ideas. Of course, then there's the tens of thousands of biological users who get great results and who uh, I can sort of feel the vicarious pleasure that when uh, they discover things, uh, that's part of why we build a lot of these tools is the enjoyment that a relatively one lab or a few labs can contribute to lots and lots of people's uh, experimentation across a very wide range of, of subjects. I, of course, have to thank the Swedish Academy and the Nobel Committee for choosing to single out this work and uh, to sprinkle fairy dust on me. I mean, I'm not any smarter today than I was yesterday, but, you know, I'm, you're all here to, you know, to, to honor this. And the last of all, of course, is that if, if I hope I haven't forgotten anyone really important, oh, my wife, who put up with me for all these years. But I need to now leave aside the human beings and uh, thank the jellyfish, because the jellyfish has been doing this for uh, probably millions of years, and nobody is very grateful to the jellyfish. In fact, nobody studies it, actually, anymore. And as I understand it, it is uh, hardly to be found anymore in its original habitat. Which uh, where this was all the materials came from Friday Harbor in uh, Puget Sound. Um, we still don't know why the jellyfish really wants to glow. Uh, we can speculate that it wants to glow because of avoiding predation, or maybe it wants sex uh, and to signal to its partners. We can speculate all we want. We haven't figured out a way of asking the jellyfish, and we don't know why. If it really wanted to be uh, glowing, why did it choose green instead of blue? Because the native protein in the jellyfish, uh, it glows, the native protein glows blue. And the job of GFP does seem to be to change it to green, but it doesn't even do a very efficient job at it. So it's as if the jellyfish is sort of half-hearted and sort of sometimes want to be bluish and sometimes wants to be greenish. And we don't understand that. And finally, we don't understand if it wanted to be blue, why didn't it fix the first protein and Instead, it chose to invent this protein that's been so useful to so many people and is responsible for the three of us getting this honor uh, today. So uh, let's also uh, uh, toast the jellyfish at some stage. Thank you. I mentioned Douglas Prasher, who Dr. Chen mentioned. He was the one who cloned GFP. By doing that, he made it available to scientists. Before that, they would have had to ground up you know, thousands of jellyfish. The Nobel Prize can only be given to three people, and had there been a fourth person that they could give it to, it would have been Douglas Prasher. Now, after cloning GFP, Douglas Prasher lost his funding, and despite his huge discovery, he had to leave science. To make ends meet, he had to drive a car dealership van in Huntsville, Alabama. When Roger Chen won the Nobel Prize, he not only flew Douglas Prasher and his wife to Stockholm to see the presentation. He singled them out in his Nobel speech, and he ultimately gave Douglas Prasher a job in his lab back in San Diego. Well, as I said, the ability to use different colors inside cells and inside genes has been invaluable to any number of disciplines. In his Nobel lecture in Stockholm, Dr. Chen talked about three areas where GFP may have an especially promising role. HIV, Alzheimer's disease, and cancer. First, he discusses GFP and the role of HIV transmission. Now, for the remainder examples I wanted to show, I have decided last night to take out the other example from my lab and instead fulfill the dictates that in the will of Alfred Nobel, which is to dis discuss more how this work benefits mankind in a general way. So this is no longer my work, but I picked a few examples from the literature uh, last night and uh, of these 30,000 papers that you've heard about. And one of them here is the sh that a recent paper uh, in the Journal of Virology from Ben Chen's lab showing that you can tag HIV, the AIDS virus, about which we heard yesterday in the medicine and physiology lectures. That can be tagged with GFP in its uh, code protein, the GAG protein. And with this, you can see that T cells actually transmit HIV by cell-cell contact through immunological synapses. So here's a cell that has already got the GFP tagged HIV. This is its next victim, and this is another victim. And over these times in minutes, just it only takes a minute or two or so, you will see green dots spread from this cell into its neighboring cell here that was initially marked with red. But the green fluorescence can also be distinguished. And you find that this guy has infected this one. And now there are a few tagged viral particles in this neighboring cell. And the significance of this is that if the 
virus can spread by direct cell-cell contact. It may never have to come outside the cell, which is where a vaccine or antibody could catch it. And this might explain why it's been so hard to use vaccines made out of antibodies to catch the HIV, because once it's been established, it can then spread from cell to cell to cell to cell internally without being exposed. And that has some profound implications, I think, for future therapy. Next, he discusses how GFP may have a role in the development of drugs for Alzheimer's disease. Then to take the famous disease, Alzheimer's disease, uh, there we know that a lot of the uh, problems do, are due to A-beta, this uh, peptide that's been chopped off from the much larger uh, Alzheimer precursor protein, and that likes to aggregate and form toxic inclusions and so on inside neurons, and eventually we want to find drugs to inhibit this process, and Michael Heck's lab, together with some uh, Korean workers, has taken A-beta-42, infused it with GFP, and they find that this molecule is Basically, if the A-beta-42 aggregates, it is essentially non-fluorescent, un un and it, pre it precipitates so rapidly that the GFP never gets a chance to fold. Therefore, no fluorescence is formed. And so you put all of these into different wells of a 96-well plate and treat each well with a different test drug, a candidate drug, and you look for a candidate drug that allows this material to fold, which meant that the A-beta-42 was prevented from aggregating. And anywhere you see the fluorescence, that is a potential drug candidate. So this is a way in which people may be able to eventually find actual pharmaceutical agents against this scourge known as Alzheimer's disease. And finally, the role of GFP in diagnosing and treating cancer. If you take a more malignant type of cancer cell, HeLa, put in initially at day one, it looks much the same, but by day 16, the tumor is bigger and it is still yellow, showing that there are still dividing cells in there. And then upon higher magnification and also staining the blood vessels blue for reference, you see that once again, we have this rich mix of green and red, including rapidly dividing cells. And in the higher magnification, where blue outlines a blood vessel, you notice there is a bit of a spatial pattern that the green cells are preferentially around the blood vessels and red cells further away. And that's because around the blood vessel, you have more oxygen and more nutrients. And so this is a testimony to the power of angiogenesis, the formation of new blood vessels, to help keep the cancer cells dividing. So I think here you see, again, an implication that helps us understand how cancer proceeds in a living animal. So I hope that with some examples from HIV, Alzheimer, and cancers, I have given you sufficient evidence that the GFP is of some benefit to mankind. I also want to include some of his closing remarks from his Nobel talk because I thought they were especially important and illustrative. So the lessons and conclusions, deliberate design and synthesis of molecules, both small and large, macro, I think is fun chemistry, and I hope to have shown you can have a significant impact on cell biology and neurobiology. You must integrate biology, chemistry, and instrumentation to all three elements uh, closely. This work was done by small teams of people, one to two people at a time, postdocs and students in an academic lab in reasonable times compatible with PhD and postdoctoral careers. You do not need an industrial-sized team, but it is essential to find the right collaborators, both at the senior and junior level. Most major biochemical signals can now or will soon be visualizable in live cells by combinations of the tricks that I've described here, mostly based on fluorescent proteins. Cells turn out to be highly individualistic, and spatial and temporal patterning are really important, and you need to see them in live cells. Finally, uh, though some people have at times criticized us for mainly working on techniques, uh, I would point out that there's an old Chinese saying that if you give a man a fish, you feed him for one day. If you teach a man how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. And that's why we enjoy devising new fishing tackle or nets, shall we say, the scoop from the ocean. And the ocean of knowledge is the only ocean that even we greedy humans will never be able to overfish. Besides all this, he organized citywide high school science seminars all over San Diego. Extremely smart guy, classy guy, and he died too soon. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tapps. To honor Dr. Chen, I was looking for a song with green in it. I especially like Green Eyes by Desi Arnaz, but I found a parody of the song by another genius, Alan Sherman. So in tribute to Dr. Roger Chen, here is Alan Sherman with Green Stamps. Thrill me with your green stamps. I love your little green stamps. I keep collecting green stamps. 
I love the way they look How I love to pick them I pick them up and lick them I lick them then I stick them In my brown green stand book 